Les petites organelles sombres en forme de fil qui se tortillent dans le cytoplasme de cette cellule. Le mot vient de mitos, le fil, et chondrios, le grain. Elles ont été décrites par l'allemand Altmann en 1886. L'utilisation de colorants spécifiques révèle leur rôle dans la respiration cellulaire. Les mitochondries sont à l'origine des bactéries intégrées dans les premières cellules à noyaux, il y a environ un milliard d'années. Pour preuve, elles ont gardé une partie de leur propre ADN. Les cellules peuvent contenir un nombre très variable de mitochondries. Les spermatozoïdes n'en possèdent qu'une, alors qu'un nouveau site en contient des dizaines de milliers, ici marqué en rouge. En conséquence, chaque organisme hérite des mitochondries de l'ovocyte maternel. All the mitochondria that make up our bodies have to come from the mother. So you can, by identifying the mitochondrial DNA structure, it's possible to trace whole populations back through the maternal line. Uh, and this has led to um, people identifying populations of the original Eve, the, the, the eternal mother who, who um, in history, who, from whom we are all um, derived with her mitochondria. The main compound which is generated by the mitochondria is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is the fundamental energy currency of all cells to do all work. The, the concept of work in cells is very general, I think. So all, all cells always have to work against the forces of entropy, and otherwise they, everything would disintegrate. And so they have to maintain their structure at least And then cells work, for example, a muscle cell that contracts does work, a cell that secretes does work. And all of that work is fueled by this simple compound, this ATP, which is made primarily by the mitochondria. Je me pose les questions de savoir d'où vient l'énergie dans l'embryon. Et la cellule œuf contient toutes les mitochondries dont elle a besoin pour son développement précoce. Et donc, un œuf, de, un œuf de souris contient entre 500, 100 000 pardon, et 300 000 mitochondries, ce qui est 1000 à 10 000 fois plus qu'une cellule différenciée d'un organe, par exemple un neurone ou une cellule du foie. L'avantage de ces mitochondries, c'est qu'elles sont intrinsèquement fluorescentes, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a pas besoin de leur mettre de marquage particulier. Grâce à des microscopes assez sensibles, on peut voir la fluorescence intrinsèque ou l'autofluorescence des mitochondries. Donc on est, on est fluorescent tous, mais ça, si on n'avait pas l'épaisseur de peau qui va bloquer la lumière, on pourrait voir la fluorescence de nos cellules à l'intérieur. On ne sait pas pourquoi les mitochondries sont autour du noyau, mais ce que tout le monde suspecte, et ce qui est une autre partie de mon travail, c'est que ces mitochondries sont là pour faire de l'énergie pour donner au noyau. Parce qu'il va y avoir des divisions, donc ça veut dire que l'ADN doit se dupliquer, les chromosomes doivent se séparer, donc tout ça nécessite de l'énergie. Il y a des localisations particulières dans les cellules neuronales, il y a des mitochondries qui sont dans les terminaisons nerveuses. On a remarqué que des mitochondries allaient spécifiquement se placer là pour pouvoir aider la transmission synaptique. You have a process which is so fundamental to the well-being of a cell. It's providing the cell with the energy that it needs to do work. As soon as anything goes wrong with that process, then that cell will fail to function normally, and in the worst case, it may die. For example, one of the things that's always fascinated me is um, we all know that if you have not enough oxygen to the brain, you faint, you lose consciousness. If you don't restore oxygen supply to the brain within a few minutes, then you start to run the risk of developing severe brain in injury, which is irreversible. And one of the key questions has to be what is it that determines the irreversibility of that injury? The same happens in the heart. Somebody has inadequate blood supply to the heart, they get a pain in the chest, which we call angina. And if oxygen supply is restored quickly, that pain goes away. But if oxygen supply is not restored sufficiently quickly, they develop a heart attack. So mitochondrial injury seems to be a key event in determining the reversibility 
an irreversibility of cell injury in response to failure of oxygen supply. And we're try we've been trying for some years to understand the mechanisms that dictate the outcome of these sorts of processes. I'm looking at the damage which happens to the heart after a heart attack and when there's a loss of blood and the blood is resupplied and the, the cells of the heart become damaged by that resupply of blood. In this experiment, isolated some cardiomyocytes there in the microscope at the moment and by adding a dye to those cells I can stain just the mitochondria and then in, on the screen you can see the mitochondria um, illuminated brightly. So then I can measure the, the energy level of the mitochondria. When the mitochondria become damaged after some time and when they can no longer make enough energy for the cell, then the cell will contract like that. That's when the cell is dying. And by scanning them with a laser, I'm causing damage to the, the mitochondria. Mitochondria here suddenly lose all of their energy and change color. Image, we've got the same cell stained with the red to indicate the mitochondria and the green, which is looking at the calcium. And we're looking at whether there's any relationship between the staining of the mitochondria and these calcium waves. In the normal heart, the, the cells are beating all the time because of waves of calcium going through the heart. And in this cell in culture, we can see the same thing happening. We, we can see a wave of calcium here in the bright green as the cell is contracting at this end and that wave goes across the cell very quickly. One reason we're looking at calcium is that during the reperfusion, when the blood comes back to the heart, then calcium levels increase and that can damage the mitochondria as well. So that might be a link between the, in the high levels of calcium we see and the damage to the mitochondria. One thing I, I want to do is um, I'll be using this micromanipulator to um, add insulin just next to the cell and I can look at the effect of adding drugs right next to the cell and if there's any change in calcium or, or mitochondria. The ability of the mitochondria to accumulate calcium allows the mitochondria to respond directly to the needs of the cell to generate increased amounts of energy. The cell uses energy when it contracts. The contraction invo involves an increase in calcium concentration. That calcium concentration is transmitted to the mitochondria, stimulates the mitochondria to make more ATP, which is needed for, again, to su replenish the, the energy supplies of the cell. And this provides an incredibly elegant mechanism that couples the demand of the cell for, for energy and the provision of energy from the mitochondria. Um, and is found almost universally wherever it's a, a phenomenon that's only been understood for the last five or ten years, but has been found, I think, in every cell type in which people have, have looked. Parce que d'un moment j'ai trouvé Guillaume quoi. Alors, c'est à moi qui paye la tournée. C'est un meeting de trois jours, c'est tout payé par le labo et tu passes trois jours à discuter. Des ovaires et d'utérus et des spermes et des animaux. Et moi je vais essayer de leur expliquer les mitochondries dans les œufs de souris. Ce qui n'est pas toujours évident. Non, je. <rire> the whole understanding of the importance and the place of mitochondria in biology has completely changed. This is partly because it was discovered about 10 years ago that mitochondria also house a number of very important proteins which are critical in um, driving a process of cell death, which is known as programmed cell death. Programmed cell death is a profoundly important phenomenon. So uh, it's very important in development. We make far more cells than we need. And then we, and many of those cells die through this uh, a process really of cell suicide. They kill themselves actively through this process of programmed cell death um, in order, for example, to shape tissues. Um, the whole process of connections in the nervous system is refined by the organized suicide of cells. And this is 
controlled largely by the release of proteins which are locked away inside the mitochondria. So the mitochondria represents a kind of uh, cupboard inside the cell in which these proteins are hidden. Um, and if those are released into the cell, they trigger the whole process of, of programmed cell death. Because mitochondria have their own DNA, it follows really that occasionally there will be mutations in that DNA, and these give rise to disease. There's quite a large number of relatively rare diseases which result from mutations of mitochondrial DNA, and these are very, very strange and very poorly understood. One of the confusing points comes from the fact that cells may actually contain a mixture of two populations of DNA. They may contain some mitochondria which have mutant DNA and some mitochondria which have normal DNA. And these may disperse into different groups of cells in a rather unpredictable and poorly understood fashion. So that the manifestation of disease may depend critically on which cells happen to carry the mutation um, later in life. There are even specific mutations which give rise to simply blindness. One my, mutation of the mitochondrial DNA which causes the patients to go blind. Uh, nothing else. And this we just don't understand at all. Very mysterious. <laughs>